every time we say goodbye, I cry a little. Every time we say goodbye, I wonder why a little. Why the gods above me who must be in the know think so little of me they allow you to go. When you're near, there's such an air of spring about it. A sparrow, yes, our sparrow somewhere waiting to sing about it. There's no love song finer, but how strange the change from major to minor. Every time we say goodbye. Thank you, Jessica. I imagine, Jessica, you know that it's one of Peter's favorite songs, especially the line about major and minor. I love that. Thank you also for attracting everyone to the stage. Thanks to all of you for being here today. Thanks especially to the stalwarts who tirelessly helped to make this happen. And thanks to all of the friends who have cheered me with your letters and cards. Thanks also to you social media mavens who continue to respond to my constant musings and those of you who have posted Peter Good tributes and revelations. Finally, thanks to my granddaughter and my sons and others who will soon share some insider insights. Michael Joplin will now call each of you to the podium. Michael, where are you? list of uh, family uh, who would like to speak. But first, is Christine Palm here? Chris Christine Palm was here. Yes, I'm right here. Right here. Christine, come up and see me, please. Christine has an award uh, from the state. Thank you. Hello, friends. I was honored to have been Peter Good's state representative. Um, when we got news of his death, I took a moment on the floor of the House, and everybody on both sides of the aisle honored him and his legacy, and the governor and the various officials have um, given us this tribute to him, this official citation, which it's my honor to read. In memoriam, 
Today, we honor Peter Good, the renowned graphic designer whose work is known throughout the world, but who resided in Chester, Connecticut. A man of tremendous dignity and grace, his reverence for the earth, for art, and for his community is unsurpassed. The General Assembly unites in wishing his wife, Jen Cummings, their children and grandchildren, solace and comfort in knowing that Peter's good, Peter Good's like will not be seen again. The world has lost one of the most creative of minds and the gentlest of souls. The Connecticut General Assembly honors him today and in perpetuity. And it's signed by Speaker of the House, Matthew Ritter, Majority Leader Jason Rojas, Lieutenant Governor Susan Bysowitz, and Governor Ned Lamont. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, now the family. It's um, their choice. The order, the order is their choice. It might only take them uh, three or four hours to decide who goes first. <laughs> but um, oh, I think there's a candidate right here. All of you are extremely brave. Uh, and then after all of them, we're going to hear from all the members of uh, the good family who wish to speak. to read to Mateo and I. Visits to Grandma and Grandpa's were made complete when after dinner, Grandpa would read The Three Little Pigs, Uncle Wiggly's storybook, or The Velveteen Rabbit. He'd sometimes recite poetry before meals and chuckle thinking about the gingham dog and the calico cat. We shared and recited Gustavo Samborska's poetry, his favorite, for much of our time together in the hospital and finally at home. Today, I see Samborska's writing as an extension of his love. Written inside of this book, he wrote, among the many marvelous revelations, here are a few of our favorites. Here's Nothing Twice by Gustavo Samborska. Nothing can ever happen twice. In consequence, the sorry fact is that we arrive here impoverished and leave without a chance to practice. Even if there is no one dumber, even if you're the planet's biggest dunce, you can't repeat the class in summer. The course is only offered once. No day copies yesterday. No two nights will teach what bliss is in precisely the same way, with exactly the same kisses. One day, perhaps, some idle tongue mentions your name by accident. I feel as if a rose were flung into a room, all hue, all scent. The next day, though, you're here with me. I can't help looking at the clock. A rose? A rose? What could that be? Is it a flower or a rock? Why do we treat the fleeting day with so much needless fear and sorrow? Is it, it's in nature not to say, today is always gone. Today is always gone tomorrow. With smiles and kisses, we prefer to seek a chord beneath our star. Although we're different, we concur, just as two drops of water are. Thank you. fun of my daughter for having to run home and write a speech and I wasn't going to say anything but just now it was jotting down some words um, so I a little bit improvised but as I sat right there and looked at their um, photograph right behind us um, I think I couldn't help but I was I think I was I was concerned about 
rolling a relationship into words and you know it's not going to do it but but when i arrived at their house for the first time at jan and peter's house at the first time about 30 years ago as a 19 year old i arrived to all of the beauty at 8 east liberty street and the beauty um the beauty of the abundance of delicacies of foods and drink and obviously in, in their household it's the visual delights so to there's the sound the lighting it's a, really a multiplicity of a of a of an amazing sensory experience to which peter is obviously was obviously a, a huge part of that with jan um so that's one huge encompassing piece actually one thing that i didn't write here which is funny we all got covid during christmas we had christmas covid and they brought us food and there was this can that had his writing of our, our, our names on, on this can. It was so gorgeous. And we we're like, oh, they got us coffee. Isn't that great? And two months later, we're thinking we're running out of our other coffee. Let's open the coffee. <laughs> but the aesthetics were so primary above everything else that we hadn't realized until we opened it that it wasn't coffee, it was peanuts. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but another thing about them is um, their model of marriage. And obviously, I'm thinking of, of Peter right now, but it's that marriage, that union, um, the grace, um, not always being perfect, but there are definitely so many examples of the graciousness in a relationship to be able to give in with humor or apologies and my deep appreciation of that modeling for, for what I need to grab onto for my own relationship. Um, I also want to thank Peter for always having an IPA there for me at the house. Um, there's always something that he said, like, oh, I have something for you there in the fridge, you know, and I just appreciate the attentiveness of that. But most of all, Peter, thank you for my husband. Um, in the, in the, um, so yes, he does very, did very delicate work with his hands, but he had to think his hands, like you didn't understand why the, like the juxtaposition of those, the delicate work that he'd do with those heavy duty hands. But my husband, Jesse also has, um, he's gotten some of Peter's hands um, and his face. I remember many years ago sitting at a restaurant um, and Jesse was sitting against the wall facing out towards the main room and Peter had gotten up to go to the bathroom and a man walked in and said, I haven't seen Peter Good in 20 years, but if you're not his son, I'll eat my head. You know? <laughs> um, and then finally, and most importantly, um, the grace with which he faced, the generosity and grace with which he faced everyone. And I you know that I'd, we're often in, in certain locations or restaurants or something, and I'd say to Jesse, um, well, what would your father do? Follow what your father would do, you know? And, and um, that's a beautiful thing. And so I introduce my husband next. And thank you, Peter. Thank you all for being here testament to the importance of community. I wrote a letter to my father, and I'm going to share it with you. Dear Pop, I admire your life. You had to overcome some hard stuff when you were younger. I don't need to tell you that but I've got to share this letter with a few folks, so bear with me. You endured unbearable pain, but it did not break you. It opened your heart. Only now, after losing you, can I begin to understand that. You gave us a love that was not always given to you. 
You created a love from scratch, just like your sewn masterpieces from scraps of fabric. Now I see the true power of creativity. It's about surviving, it's about living, and it's about loving. It's about communicating, and it's about connecting. Your spirit evolved, and we will pass it on. We had an intense few weeks there when we knew your time was limited. You were handed a death sentence. You impressed us all with your grace, your generosity, your acceptance, your gratitude, your kindness, your humor. These things you expressed throughout your life. But seeing you tested with the ultimate, your courage was amazing. In the face of death, you laughed. You were grateful. You assured us. And you taught us. I could not say I love you enough to make my pain go away. Very naive, I know, but I did try. To help you with your pain, we let you go. Your loss is, your loss is devastation. Why must we lose loved ones? We lost your body, but we still have your love. I and we will pay it forward. Your legacy, along with your achievements and acclaim, your intellect and your exquisite craft is love and kindness. And that is even better than the best logo ever made. I know you are okay now. You are having a beer at the paddock honk. You are watching the game upstairs. You're sketching a design. You're playing badminton with Ma. You're napping with a cat. You're making tampanade for the bull game. You're playing bull with friends. You're sewing. You're causing mischief with Butchy Bizeni and company in some abandoned lot in the north end of Hartford. You are smiling. You are so glad to see us when we visit you. You're beaming as your grandkids walk in the door. You are so proud of them. You are so proud of me. And that's a gift. You are watching over us and encouraging us. I can hear you. Thank you, my pop, my captain. I love you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for being here. Um, <clears throat> I think you guys all know what a wonderful, uh, kind, sweet person uh, my dad was. I want to share some lesser-known metaphysical data points about uh, my father. Um, is this okay? Volume alert. Peter Sparrow. Yeah. That's actually a recent uh, nickname. Some of you might know that the last, our last name, Good, 
is not our original Lithuanian name. That uh, that's an Ellis Island name, and our original Lithu Lithuanian name on the on Peter's father's side is Yaskushkov, which we learned years ago was Lithuanian for sparrow. And when I found that out, I was telling my wife Jenny about that, and she's like, "Oh, you know, actually sparrow. That's that's actually a perfect name. He's that kind of fits his avian." personality and he as you guys know if you know his work he he always birds were a theme for him that's where his name Peter Spare came from and um, you know there's an ancient Hindu poem that describes our soul as a bird that perches on the branch of our of our body and flies off when the body's done um, when the anesthesiologist asked uh, Peter Sparrow if he had any questions, his question was, uh, Mr. Anesthesiologist, does, the, does consciousness survive the brain? That was a good question. That kind of stumped him. Um, the first clear memory of my father is sitting with him on the old front porch of my parents' house, learning a game he taught me which we call the drawing game. And all you need is a, a pen and a blank piece of paper. And the first person makes a mark or a visual idea, and the next person reacts to that idea. And a visual dialogue begins, the objective being similar to a good conversation, where no one person dominates the direction of the discussion but where you end up going in some new direction that neither person could have anticipated. And in the most interesting drawings, unfolding wholeness emerges, which is a situation where each mark preserves the structure already there while gently enhancing it and bringing out some new structure that was only implicit. So simple, and yet it embodies Peter Spira's whole philosophy of design and vision, using visual expression to communicate, to respond, to nurture wholeness, to, to bring creativity to our relationships. Wow, that was a beautiful gift that he, he gave us. Thank you, Great Spirit, for the creativity of Sparrow and for what he channeled through us. Uh, countless times, my dad would invite us into his office and share a design problem he's working on, asking us which version we liked, engaging us in dialogue about how the various elements affected us, sharing his thinking about the inner workings of design. Uh, he often said that he was attracted to graphic design over the fine arts because he loved the constraints related to effective communication his desire to, uh, to merge the subjective world of art with the design world of communication led to his life in which he could serve and engage his community through design. This weaving together of the personal and the communal, the artistic and the practi practical, that's always been a huge inspiration for us. And that's why you guys are here today. So, uh, I want to echo what my mom said and thank you guys for, for being beautiful friends, being beautiful allies to our family. Thank you, beautiful beings, for being you. Um, my brother Jesse mentioned that my dad, uh, he signed up for a pretty, pretty serious learning forgiveness opportunity with his 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 family his, his original family he had a brilliant he had a loving mother but a very kind of uh, a brilliant but tempestuous father and uh, he I think that was what part of the what he signed up for in this this mission was to kind of heal that that anger and and he did that beautifully I asked him once, hey, Bob, what was your goal when you were trying to raise Jesse and I? And he, saw, he said, we just wanted you to know who you are. 
And as a philosopher, that's like, that's the best answer you could give. That's like pretty awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Peter Sparrow, for that love of, of knowledge. He's a great father. He continues to be a great father to us. If I had one bone to pick with my dad, it, was, it would be over metaphysics. No, 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 nothing practical. Near the beginning of his final ordeal, uh, he, he, he loved to read. He's a very literate person. And he, he quoted, kind of with this dark chuckle, he quoted Nabokov saying, our existence is but a brief crack of light between two eternities of darkness. And he kind of winked at us. And um, I said, I don't think that's right, Pop. I think it's the opposite. Our existence is a brief crack of darkness between two eternities of light. And uh, he thought that was hilarious. He, he laughed out loud. But I believe, based on what we experienced during his final exam, that he actually came to agree with that. He, he literally saw the light. He even told us so. He says, I know we will be together. He said, I, I don't know how I know that, but I know it. And that was, that was amazing. And um, this, this knowingness, this illumination allowed Sparrow to laugh and joke his way through this this final kind of ordeal, as you guys know, went really fast. He never once said anything like, I'll miss you guys. He never said that. He never expressed, oh, I wish I had more time. No, he was, he expressed his love for us without any attachment, and he kept insisting that he needed to be on his way. He had like an appointment. <laughs> Seriously, he did. And he had no qualms about it. He was being emotional for our sake, but he was already a couple steps ahead of us. And I, I've thought for a while that this is kind of like the last embodied lesson that every great teacher offers while on their way out the door. That when they, that they will not be gone when their body is gone. They will actually be more present and I'm sure a lot of you guys feel that way. When you leave, you lose, you appear to lose a loved one. Actually, their their presence intensifies in your life, and it, it, it becomes even more direct and more continuous. And that's the good news. And that this does make our life worth living, this continuity. And it does mean that love will save us, and it will actually bring us peace. I'd like to share one Final data point, Peter Sparrow shared three amazing dreams that he had, dream fragments, his very last days. In the first, he was reviewing the work of some designs. <laughs> and uh, he was in some kind of monastery or like a spiritual community. And he described, he said he was looking at a, a, a logo that looked like the, the profile of a monk and he proved on it. He's like, this is beautiful. And they'd carved it into the side of a wall. And um, in the second fragment, he was asked to look at a beautiful garden of fruit that was growing. And someone standing next to him in the, in the dream remarked that they thought that the fruit was too ripe. And Sparrow took a deep, loving look at that fruit. And he said, no, they're perfectly ripe. Yeah. And... Um, and the last fragment, he shared with us that he, he was asked to visit an esoteric design firm. And uh, they, they brought him in with some gravity and uh, they asked him, they described this design problem to him. And they asked him how he would begin to solve that problem. And in his dream, he took out of his pocket what he described as a hand-sharpened pencil. 
and he held it up to them and he said, I'd begin with this. And that's so him. It was a, he was a conceptualist and he believed that if a design is really good, you should be able to kind of like draw it, you know, shouldn't be driven by technology. So deep blessings to Peter Sparrow, deep blessings to all of you, deep blessings to the great spirit. Uh -huh. Trusting, accepting, and loving it has sustained me through the best and worst days of my life. Even on Tuesday, May 2nd, when an exceedingly good man was prepared, determined curious and relieved as he anticipated shedding an aching body. And when wanting to be certain of next steps, he reiterated previously shared directives. Find an ironic container for my ashes. <laughs> Add Arrows remains and something by Mateo. Peter talked about a memorial such as this one. It would be at the meeting house, banners, photographs, design projects on display, friends sitting at tables conversing and drinking wine, maybe even dancing on the stage. How could this shocking turn of fortune occur as suddenly? Just five Sundays ago, we were preparing to hop in the Subaru to play pool for the afternoon. Instead, we drove to the Westbrook Clinic. A mass was detected in Peter's brain. Three days later, an aggressive tumor was removed. Surgery was not a cure. His most primal physical abilities severe, were severely diminished. Fortunately, however, his intelligence, memory, and unique humor remained intact, were even enhanced. It's impossible to express the magnanimity with which he approached these final days. His gentle acceptance of the prognosis and his profound gratitude affected every individual involved with his care. Though his physical presence is now lost to us, Peter is here with us, his heart aching love for our family, friends, and community lives on in his legacy. And he'll be with me every time I continue the work we accomplished together. Along with acceptance, feelings of guilt arise. Why couldn't it be me? Of course it had to be my man. 
He often joked, if you leave me, take me with you. <laughs> he would have been unhinged without the partner who took care of the mundane yet essential practicalities. Paying bills, checking bank balances, knowing the way around social media, <clears throat> managing our website, researching where our dwindling retirement savings might earn decent interest. Meanwhile, friends might fear that I'll be lost without him. Don't worry. Peter's always with me. He answers every time I need to know what font to use for the new book. He helps me choose which images to place on the pages. <clears throat> he admonishes me when I take an inordinate amount of time fussing with the typography. Though I, though I trust that ultimately he'll agree it was worth the extra effort. He tells me to put down the damn mouse and go downstairs and have something to eat. And he laughs when he sees Wanda and Marlo up on the kitchen counter yeah, pestering me for that morning treat. Would you be surprised to hear that this brilliant, talented, exuberant, accomplished, funny, famous guy was not the man of my dreams? <laughs> you know, the tall, dark stranger who could sweep a young maiden off her feet and carry away to his castle in the clouds? Oh no, he was not that guy. <laughs> Peter Kenneth Good was a new friend a kind and gentle fellow art student who charmed the cleaning woman in the hallways by chanting, Marion, Madam Custodian. <laughs> he poured milk and honey into my freshly brewed tea. He helped me stretch my painting canvases and sometimes shared concepts for class assignments. Perhaps because he listened, understood, and appreciated my singular qualities more than anyone ever had, I knew almost on first encounter that he would eventually be my one and only. Are you aware that I was, I was the one who proposed? <laughs> After Peter's graduation in 1965, he planned to seek employment with a prestigious design firm in the Big Apple. I suggested he not go away. Why not stay here and find a job on campus? We married two days before the start of my senior year. Peter began work in Yukon's publications office. We rented a tiny lakeside cottage in Coventry. Our first cat arrived at the front door. The script was written. We followed it faithfully for 59 years. <laughs> Today, I trust that my life with Peter Sparrow, my one and only good man, will continue on as preordained. Thank you, Jen. Nathan Garland, who I haven't met, 
but he is to speak next. And this must be Nathan Garland. Can you hear me? No. Yes? Peter was a great friend. Peter was so present, so alive, and so gifted. He was thoughtful one moment and laughing the next. I feel lucky that this fine fellow and I were close friends for decades. He is still with us in our hearts and minds. Our periodic dinners were a treat. They often included Bob Appleton, who's here, and Frank Lionetti. We brought work both by us and others to show and discuss. Our rants and raves were wide ranging. Everything was fair game. One key subject was the advent of the computer. Sometimes Peter and I helped each other privately. If one of us had a question about a prog project in progress, we might call the other to brainstorm about possible solutions. We occasionally competed, but Peter's generosity of spirit was boundless. Once he even shared a client with me Mutual respect, shared values, and common goals were ties that bound us together. And Jan, you and Peter, of course, were a unique pair. Your personal and professional partnership has been an inspiration. see Michelle Paulson in a couple of years. Huh. Uh, she's our next speaker. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I just want to thank the family for giving me this honor to be able to speak here. Um, 
I'm going to open up with the novelist and poet May Sarton said, the people we love are built into us. Every day I am suddenly aware of something someone taught me long ago, or just yesterday. My name is Michelle Parr Paulson. I am proud to be counted among those who have worked for Peter Good and Jan Cummings Good. And even more so to be blessed with their loving friendship all, all these years. I first met Peter Good when I was in my late 20s while working for an ad agency. The agency had been awarded a big account, the Special Olympic World Games. And my then boss, Tom Bradley, and I traveled to Chester to meet with Peter and to see if he would be interested in crafting a logo and identity system for this massive and important event. As we sat and talked about the needs of the imagery and my boss outlined the scope of the work, I looked over at Peter, who was already sketching the various details we were describing into visual form. After Peter agreed to take the job, we said our goodbyes and walked out. In the parking lot, my boss looked at me and said, now don't go leaving me for Peter Good. <laughs> I eventually did, and <laughs> it was one of the best decisions of my professional career. I was hired as a client, uh, client account manager for then Peter Good Graphic Design. I bring that up because I was at the company at one of its most transformative moments. I witnessed it evolve into Cummings and Good when Jan became a major force in the company's creative operations. Okay, I wasn't going to cry, but I'm going to try not to. I remember feeling honored to be witnessing their collaboration. I thought to myself, wow, this couple is a powerhouse. I loved watching them exchange ideas and perfect imagery, a synchronous partnership. One would pick up where the other left off, and the outcome was always masterful. Even though Peter would often encourage Jan, who Peter felt she had a tendency to be over-perfective. <laughs> and he would say to her a lot, come on, it's fine, Jan, let's go home. For me, it's always Peter and Jan, Jan and Peter. They had their own identities, but somehow created a singular one too. Peter and Jan are incredibly generous, as many of us here know. We worked hard at the office, but they always made a point to celebrate, taking the office out for lunches, dinners, New Year's parties at Restaurant Du Village, River Tavern. Peter and I learned early on that we shared a common connection to Hartford. He grew up there in the same neighborhoods my parents did and attended the same high school, Buckley High, as my uncle and aunt. And I believe there are some Buckley High School attendees here. <laughs> we also discovered we had a similar upbringing with parents who shared similar challenges that we would every now and then talk about, especially how it shaped us both being people pleasers for good or for bad. I'd like to think in our cases it was for good. At the office, Jan and Peter always made me feel so special, especially with life milestones. I turned 30 while there, became pregnant with my firstborn, my first child, Maxwell. His name is inspired by their son's Jesse, their son Jesse's middle name, Jesse Maxwell Good. Both Jan and Peter were at my parents' funerals, both of them. With their encouragement, I eventually created my own consultancy, and in 2007, I worked with Jonathan Rapp, chef and owner of River Tavern Restaurant here in Chester. And we created a summertime benefit series called Dinners at the Farm. Together, we approached Peter to develop a logo mark for the event. Peter created a mark that captured the essence of the dinners, marrying playful, handmade topography with an illustrated chicken weather vane. <laughs> and every year since, except this one, he and Jan created the farm dinner postcards featuring their illustrations of corn or chickens. For this year's Dinners at the Farm, 
We're dedicating the season to Peter. Something went wrong with my notes. <laughs> huh, okay. Hmm, right when that happens. Let's see, what's this one here? Ah, okay. Back to my earlier quote. The people we love are built into us. Every day I am suddenly aware of something someone taught me long ago, or just yesterday. What I learned from Peter Good, riding in a car with an open coffee mug, a ceramica mug, proofing Fortune 500 company annual reports, what to look for at press checks, the economy of using the whole press sheet. If you have an image like a poster, why not make note cards and or postcards and put them all up on one sheet? Ligatures and other typography nuances. The term less is more. You can put it all down, but then edit it to simple elements that will best tell the story. Bigger is not better. Some clients would like to be, use big headlines, but sometimes the smaller type commands a greater importance. Having limitations often creates some of the best designs. We heard that from Justin. Making olive tapenade. Engage the viewer. For example, I had negotiated with the Museum of Modern Art in New York to include Peter for a Christmas card design. He chose to create a colorful rendering of the word joy. But with his clever thinking, he engineered the card so the O in joy was die cut and spun around, making the graphic image of joy even more joyful. I learned about four letter words. Yes, those words too with Peter, but words more like slow, food, love, play, time, all of which were the themes for the popular and iconic C&G calendar. I learned about those words through the endless search of literary and often obscure quotes to help support those themes. Some may think that a food calendar would showcase all sorts of delicious looking food. Oh no, not with C&G. One month stands out. A beautiful image of the globe from the perspective of space with the caption, enough food. The ability to see things differently and present them in an unexpected way that made you think and ultimately made you smile was Peter's specialty. His posters, love stamps, Chester Squirrel, and countless other imagery that many here are so familiar with are testaments to this unique quality. I love the way Peter looked at the world, always with a wry sense of humor. He could be serious, but he had a wonderful way of putting things into a funny perspective. He also liked to tease me. Recently, I found an old birthday card he made after he and Jan visited Florence. <laughs> Florence, Italy. On the cover is his handwriting. It said, happy birthday, Michelle, from a very special person in Florence. After breaking the seal and opening the card, there was a perfectly cropped photo of the statue of David's torso, just below the stomach and above the knees. You get the picture. I'm sure Peter was chuckling to himself the whole time he was making that card. The rest of the card said, and Peter and Jan wish you the best of almost everything. The way Peter labeled his files was funny too. I still remember the black filing cabinet in his part of the office with the top cabinet labeled quasi-active. <laughs> One of the biggest things I learned from Peter was to take your time, even though he would tease me about being late. I don't think that's what he meant by take your time. <laughs> but Peter was always so generous with his time. He took his time in developing the creative for any given project. It was labor of thoughtfulness. He also took his time with many of the folks that would wander into the office, whether it was with friends who dropped in or complete strangers. He would pour you a glass of sparkling water or wine, sit you down at the big round conference table, and took the time to be with you, listen, share a funny story, be curious and laugh. 
I always felt I mattered when I was with Peter Good. I think the same is true for many of you who knew him too. I'll end with this quote by Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Peter's greatest legacy of all, I think, is the indelible mark he made through his boundless talent and generosity of spirit on the hearts of all those who knew him or encountered his work. Peter Good, I will miss you. I already miss you. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Michelle. Fritz Schellinghaus. I know you'd like me to shut up so you could get out of here before it rains. I'll be quick. Thank you very much. Um, I had breakfast with Peter and Jan uh, the Friday before he got ill, and it was one of those classic, <clears throat> you, it appeared like minimal effort, and it was, but it was exquisite, and it went on for about four hours. My wife had already called the police, and, but, but Peter and Jan and I were engaged in the kind of conversation that you always had with them. Um, the... the um, following Monday, um, I called him at home, I thought, because I knew that he'd been um, with his Boole group, and I wanted to see how it went. And he answered the phone, and it was kind of he was kind of fumbling, and he started to laugh, and he said, oh my God, I'm doing what you had once. And I said, what? He said, well, I'm trying to get out of the goddamn bathroom here at the hospital with this pole and all these bags on it. And I said, I thought you went to play Boole yesterday. He said, oh no. He said, I've got a brain tumor. Well, that was astonishing. Um, to me, but in some ways, maybe, no, surprising. Not surprising. Um, three days before Peter died, he and Jan called me from the Lawrence Memorial Hospital and asked if I'd write, <clears throat> excuse me, a memorial. And that was stunning because I was sure he was coming home and that there'd be some recovery and maybe it wouldn't be painless and maybe it would go on a long time, but I sure didn't think that they were asking me to write a memorial for a service. Um, I did write it in a kind of weird days and later Jan called me and asked me if I would read it today which which I'm honored to I want to tell the story just quickly first there was a time and many of you remember this when Jan and Cummings and Good produced a postcard the, the title of which escapes me a little bit but it was ladies night out um, for conversation and shopping and that sort of annoyed me so I created something called nights out with a capital Ken capital K and said to Peter Maybe we should have a, a nights out with some other some other guys for some conversation and fun. And he thought, of course, that it was a good idea because it was right up um, his alley. And he was the first one to say yes. And then we talked to Larry Bloom, who said yes, and Anthony Collins and Richard Calder and Dave Hallahan. But it was Peter, time and time again, year after year, and I think this went on for 10 years, who would call me and say, you know, I think it's about time for another dinner. He, and he was in his element, as, as you all know. I mean, just lively thinking and ideas and conversation. So we agreed to meet at each other's homes, and, and the agreement was that we would get food at Pasta Vita so nobody would try to one-up everybody else's Vichy Soise and Coco Van. So, But Peter was not about to have anything to do with that. So he and Anthony Collins and Richard Calder always put on an extraordinary feast and magnificent food. Um, Peter was helped once by Claude, but that, that was still Peter's dinner. Linen and china and silver and, and crystal, it was, it was extraordinary. And I think Larry and David and I felt like little kind of woebegones sitting around serving our, our pasta vita. And um, we were kind of hapless. Dave Hollihan got lost one time trying to find Anthony's house. Larry 
showed up in a, with a, might call a hostess gift of a six pack of alcohol free beer. I don't know what that was all about. Nobody touched it in my mind. Um, but it, it didn't, it didn't matter because the camaraderie was, was remarkable and Peter was about as appreciative of it and, and, and active in it as anybody uh, could have been. Over the years, and as I say, I think this went on for 10, I wish I could remember the first one. We'd all, we pick a topic and sometimes it was beauty or art or creativity or human foibles and virtues until all of a sudden we got old. And the conversation was, what the hell with your hip? What about my knee? So um, that went on for a while until Larry showed up at one of our last dinners and said, look, before we get to a serious topic, let's get the organ recitals out of the way. <laughs> so God, how hard Peter laughed. So good night, sweet night, the, the, the fairest of them all. And I'll, I'll read this quickly, the, this memorial that I wrote. The heart feels empty. So too the village of Chester and other places near and far where Peter was well known and dearly loved, where he was admired by endless acquaintances, treasured by fellow artists, art lovers, foodies, bull buddies and bibliophiles, appreciated by a thousand happy clients and an extraordinary array of colleagues and designers, writers, editors, photographers, topographers, paper specialists and vendors. He was recognized, of course, by passers-by on the street and by loads of people who just knew the name Peter Good. It, it, astonishing how one person could be so connected to so many people. And I think maybe it's because his heart was so full of genuine curiosity about people. He was so self-effacing, sincere, trusting, and respectful to, to everyone uh, with a natural capacity to exude and elicit a joie de vivre. His, his, his mantra was always, Carpe diem, and he did indeed. Um, a generous and, 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 and driven intellect, his flawless eye for truth in beauty, in dignity, and integrity, a vibrant creativity that defines every stereotype and lives on in a legacy of distinctive, <coughs> admired work, not least in his labor of love for the arts throughout Connecticut. Should we be surprised that renderings of the heart appeared so often in his art? This most magnetic man wore his heart on his sleeve, engendered the same in others, no guile, no falseness, no hypocrisy, a sweet, kind, gentle humility, humility in a life of renowned work and exquisite humanity. At the center always, his beloved wife, Jan. The yin to his yang, his wife, his best friend, his partner as attentive parents of Justin and Jesse, as grandparents of Matteo and Olive, and as relentless stewards of innumerable feline friends. <laughs> Jan was his spiritual companion, a compatible, unfailing colleague, colleagues over decades, day in and day out, night after night of discussing and dissecting and debating um, in their search for truth and beauty in every image, every typeface, every stroke of the pencil. She was his barber, although I don't know how this, this accounts for a haircut, but the hair over the ears was his <laughs> signature. Don't give up your day job, Jan. Um, and, and, and regards, he, she was his haberdasher, although uh, I, I must say black, 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 why she couldn't throw in some pink and green and yellow every now and then was beside me. Um, and, and she was his savior um, in all things having to do with even the, the most humble technology and he was always the first to admit I don't know how to do it but Jan does and he was grateful and accepted his own shortcomings in that one area and theirs was a working living loving relationship the epitome of sublime synergy in the end at home in Peter's last few hours a remarkable family not emptied by grief but enriched and powered by Peter's request that they celebrate his life their lives together, gathered around him in his bed to savor favorite anecdotes and memories, achievements, times of laughter, beauty and love, appreciation for the gift of life. And for those of us, most of us here today, who were grieving on the outside, bereft, we couldn't help but be inspired by the family's supreme dignity, grace and courage, their stoic, tender and lovingness, 
the true joy in that makeshift bedroom that you know was reflected in Peter's smiling eyes. One is wary of both not saying enough, of missing some great characteristic of Peter, or of saying too much as if you could ever really gild that lily. It might suffice for the moment to remember being greeted by Peter at a crowded party, a small gathering in a restaurant or on the street, at the door of his home or office, those bright, sparkling eyes widening with pleasure, the broad smile, his arms spread wide for an embrace. The drawn out way he said your name, pronouncing every syllable with love and affection. He was very discerning, but for sure his heart was so generous that those eyes, that smile, the big hug spoke welcome. You knew in Peter's company that you were in a space that battered to both of you. God bless. Thank you, Fritz. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Boyer. as the Furies seem to be upon us anyway. My wife, Tricia, and I first had the pleasure to meet Peter and Jan 30 years ago when I was a young director of the Mark Twain House, um, an institution some of you may know. The introduction was made uh, with a sense of urgency and prescience by um, Deborah Petke and Jennifer LaRue, and to this day I couldn't be more grateful for their insight and their encouragement that we should come to know Jan and Peter. We had a number of projects together at the museum, as you may well know, and uh, Peter always wanted to make sure that the, the legacy of Mr. Clemens was constantly looking over my shoulder. That seems to still be the case as I speak before you today. Institutional identity, Mark Twain days, campaign materials, wayfinding signage for the new museum. We had a number of projects over the course of a, more than a decade. But the project that I loved the most that we shared had to do with uh, a piece by Saul LeWitt. Through the help of Carol LeWitt, um, the museum that I next ran down in North Carolina, the entrance to the new building uh, was to have an immense wall drawing by Saul. And in working with Carol at the foundation, they told me, well, and of course, we'll have a lead artist work with you on this project. And I said, well, who is that? And they said, uh, well, be, it'll be a Jesse Good. And I said, you know, that's funny. I know a Jesse Good. I mean, how many Jesse Goods could there be? And as it turned out, it was this Jesse Good. Jesse came to town and stayed there for several weeks. Uh, the leader, the teacher for a number of young artists, college students who were helping to execute Saul's wonderful image. And one of those artists was my son, such as the nature of nepotism. And, uh, and so there, for weeks on end, climbing up and down the scaffolding in the still unfinished building uh, Jesse and my son Ryan worked together uh, to bring this wonderful piece to life. And so there was Jesse, the teacher, and Ryan, my son, the student. And I thought, how apt. In that I was never Peter's client, I had always hoped to be his friend, but what I really was, was his student. Peter was a great teacher in so many ways. About people, insight, history patience, candor, endurance. One day in 1999, short story, we were just talking as guys about our work and our lives and I found myself lamenting 
you know, this is a big job. I barely have time for my family. There's like no me time. Um, and he said, well, if you did have more time for yourself, how would you use it? And I said, well, you know, I would read poetry. I haven't read poetry for years. And even the poetry that I did read was kind of predictable, dumb guy poetry, right? Uh, T.S. Eliot and um, Yeats and Keats and Whitman. So not uninformed, but very retarded to air. Several weeks later, I received in the mail an envelope from Peter. And in it was the photocopy of a poem by Billy Collins, a poem that Peter had just read aloud at one of your family gatherings. It was called Forgetfulness, and about the advent, the, the encroachment of Alzheimer's. That's not the poem I'll read to you today. But the poem that I will read to you is from that same collection of poems, which I quickly ran out and purchased, ever the eager student. Uh, questions about angels. And so, The Afterlife by Billy Collins. If I can do it. While you are preparing for sleep, brushing your teeth or riffling through a magazine in bed, the dead of the day are setting out on their journey. They're moving off in all imaginable directions, each according to his own private belief, and this is the secret that silent Lazarus would not reveal, that everyone is right, as it turns out. You go to the place you always thought you would go, the place you kept lit in an alcove in your head. Some are being shot into a funnel of flashing colors, into a zone of light, white as the January sun. Others are standing naked before a forbidding judge who sits with a golden ladder on one side and a coal chute on the other. Some have already joined the celestial choir and are singing as if they have been doing this forever while the less inventive find themselves stuck in a big air-conditioned room full of food and chorus girls. <laughs> Some are approaching the apartment of a female god, a woman in her 40s with short, wiry hair and glasses hanging from her neck by a string. With one eye, she regards the dead through a hole in her door. There are those who are squeezing into the bodies of animals, eagles and leopards, and one trying on the skin of a monkey like a tight suit, ready to begin another life in a more simple key. While others float off into some benign vagueness, little units of energy heading for the ultimate elsewhere. There are even a few classicists being led to an underworld by a mythological creature with a beard and horns. He will bring them to the mouth of a furious cave, guarded over by Edith Hamilton and her three-headed dog. <laughs> the rest of us just lie on their backs in their coffins, wishing they could return so they could learn Italian, or see the pyramids, or play some golf in a light rain. They wish they could wake in the morning like you, and stand at a window examining the winter trees, every branch traced with the ghost writing of snow. And some just smile forever on. Thank you. Thank you. We're approaching the uh, the end. Um, there's a book uh, of uh, personal thoughts for Peter. Jan, where is the book? Uh, where's the book? Yeah, Leanne took it. It's inside. Yeah, inside. It's inside. Out of the rain. And out of the rain. Which and you'll all be out of the rain in a second. <laughs> Uh, please go inside and please. Louder. 
make sure that you uh, make sure that you sign the, the book. Um, Michael, they can't hear you. You can't hear me. Yeah. Oh, okay. What Jessica told me is that she can't hear me. <laughs> So, <laughs> what, what I'm telling you, <laughs> there's a there's a guest book. A Peter Peter's book is inside, and the family would uh, certainly appreciate it if everyone went in, in uh, and signed it. Um, take home a Weller's uh, button and a, uh, a "You Are Good" button. M make sure you do that. Um, and the um, his ashes are also inside, um, and I think. Janet, there's a statement with it. Uh, so please go and uh, uh, view Peter's ashes and read the statement and um, so on. Um, now a few thoughts from me, <laughs> and I'll be brief. I want you to thank you all for being here today. I knew Peter... I knew Peter for 36 years. I will miss him. A person of immense integrity, creative talent, wonderful humor, generosity, and an overwhelming dedication to Jan and his family. person whose imagination to work and living are so large, so vital, it is hard to see him as absent. But indeed, in some real sense, he will not be absent. For me and all who gather here, to remember him, he will always enrich our lives. His work, his poetic and rich visual imagination, his creativity, sometimes simplistic, will continue to, to surprise us and remind us of his grace and humor. We will not allow him to wander far. Now for Peter, to Peter, I invite you to raise another glass of wine. Thank you. the pragmatist I would really really appreciate it if you would bring home those beautiful plastic glasses we really don't want to have to throw them away or throw them in the dishwasher ourselves I have used one of mine at the house test I've probably washed it about five times so please take your glasses and if there is a lot of biscotti left, throw some of the biscotti in the glasses because we don't know what to do with all that biscotti if there's some left. So. Awesome. Please, thank you for coming. And we love to share the idea of being good. So there's a big bucket of good buttons. Grab a few of them and share the idea that we are all good and we're happy to be alive and share the joy. Thank you.